class in here. We're going to try to get started uh, quickly here because we want to make sure that our speaker has plenty of time to share with us today. Uh, so why don't we stand together? We're going to sing this song, Majesty, to get our day started off right. Uh, praising the Lord in song. Let's sing this hymn together, Majesty. see you today. We're going to pray together and ask God's blessing as uh, we get started here. Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, uh, we, this is a day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And Lord, uh, we've gathered together for a good purpose today as we celebrate your creation that you've made. And Lord, help us to uh, focus on you this morning, to think about the uh, messages that are given, and Lord, to apply them to our lives. We pray for our speaker, Brother Matt, that you'd uh, just fill him with your spirit. And uh, may we be ready to receive what he has for us here today. And uh, Lord, again, just bless each family, um, every person that's represented here. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can be seated there, and uh, we're glad to welcome back uh, Matt Miles. He was speaking here last night, did two sessions and a question and answer time, and did a phenomenal job, I thought. Uh, shared a lot of uh, wisdom from Scripture with us, but then uh, helped us see um, how the, um, the, the, the world's view... Uh, the world's worldview does not line up with the biblical worldview. And so this morning, he's going to go into a little bit more detail about that and explain a little bit about biblical worldview um, in this Sunday School Hour. So, Brother Matt, why don't you come along and share that with us today? Thank you, brother. Good morning, everybody. Morning. So this morning, my task is to cover all of biblical worldview. <clears throat> So you're going to have to hang on. <laughs> Those of you that are note takers, um, there's going to be a list here in a little bit of 12 things. 12 things that are vitally important that, that connect Genesis to the gospel. Connect Genesis to reality, to everything around us. If we do not study and, and understand the first several chapters of Genesis correctly, things will be skewed in our worldview. Okay. Our desire at Creation Truth Foundation is, our mission, if you will, is we like to train disciples to trust that this history is correct, it's accurate in the way it's written, so that when we can trust the history of this Bible and everything that's in it, we can then trust the eternal promises in it without having to have blind faith, as I mentioned last night. So, so this morning... This, this discussion of biblical worldview, connecting Genesis to the gospel. I want to start with a simple definition of worldview. It's a set of beliefs based on a foundation of truth that we use to guide our life. I, I use specifically the term a foundation of truth. Because not everybody says that this is absolute truth. So for everybody in the world, everybody has some kind of foundation that they think is true. Are you with me? Some put their trust in this as being true. Some don't. Some think there are other things that are true. Whether it be science or whether it be whatever, whatever it is. It goes beyond even just science. But see, the thing is, everybody has a worldview. Everybody is biased 100% to something. To something. 
I am wholeheartedly biased 100% to this book. First, in whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm going to teach, whatever I'm going to go study, whatever I'm going to go observe, test, repeat, falsify, do scientific things with, I start here. Not everybody does that. Case in point, I want you to listen to this gentleman on the right. Do you know who he is? Bill Nye, the science guy. Who, who, who grew up listen, listening to him, seeing him? He is still very prominent within our culture. He still, his, his videos are being shown actively in science classrooms around the world. So, this morning I want to start by, I want you to listen to his worldview for a second. Ago. How appropriate do you think it is to teach creationism to children? Uh, it's completely inappropriate in science class. Now, if you want to teach it in the history of religion or uh, uh, fascinating human undertakings, uh, uh, creation myths that turned out not to be true, 101 then that's fine but it's not it's not science it's not it's nothing to do with uh, the way we know nature well let me ask the obvious follow-up and that is what's the harm oh then you raise a generation of kids you have the potential for raising a generation of kids and doesn't understand how we have everything that we have how we have food how we have the electronics that allow us to have this a video conversation through the internet across a continent. It's, uh, none of this would be possible without the, the discoveries that were made through the process of science. When you try to embrace the ideas of creationists, as I understand it, who insist, apparently, that the Earth is six or somehow 10,000 years old, that's completely inconsistent with the scientific method and everything that we know. And so uh, you just don't want to have kids growing up with this conflict, this worldview of that's that's wrong. You want so if you're here today and you believe as I do that this is truth, that the Lord created everything in six days as He said He did six thousand years ago, you cannot possibly understand where food came from. That's what He said. Did you catch that? He connected the dot of, if you believe in the word of God and a creator, you don't understand how we have food. You don't understand how, how to use the internet. How we could have the internet at all. You don't understand how to do science if you believe in the word of God. Really. You know, as much as his show at present, or that was, I believe it's been canceled actually, um, Bill Nye saves the world. You know what? There's only one man that will save the world. His name is Jesus Christ. I would like Bill Nye to stand before Sir Isaac Newton and say, you can't be a scientist and believe in the word of God. See, Sir Isaac Newton, one of the most brilliant men to ever walk on the planet, most likely, he... he he was a great scientist. He, 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 he gave us and discovered things, you know, minor things like gravity. He, he, he discovered, you know, laws that govern planetary motion. You know, minor things in science. Yet he wrote more commentaries on the word of God than he did of anything scientific. There are more works written by Sir Isaac Newton on the word of God then there is scientific things. In the margins of his, of his discoveries, as he was discovering a new law of something in science, he would write to the praise and glory of God in the margins. That is hooey. To say, you cannot do science and believe in the word of God. Throughout history, it has been documented more than once that those men that, that were doing science that discovered some of the basic laws that govern the rest of science right now, the rest of our understanding, they were godly men. They were Bible-believing men. So to say those things, that, that's totally ridiculous to me. 
Yet he has, he has a voice within our world. His worldview is prominent right now. So, worldview. See, worldview affects how we see things. Last night we talked about dinosaurs. What is this? See, there's a worldview question here for you this morning. Don't answer. Which has been on earth longer, T-Rexes or chickens? See, how you answer that question tells me about your worldview. A, a lot of people will answer that, well, T-Rexes have been here longer. Not understanding biblically, they're wrong. Chickens were created on day five. Everything winged was made on day five. Everything land-dwelling, including T-Rexes, was made on day six. Chickens have been here technically 24 hours prior to T-Rexes. But see, there's the concerted effort, as I mentioned last night, that says some dinosaurs evolved into present-day birds. And there are Christians, professing Christians, Bible believers, that are like, well, and I go, have you read the first chapter? The first chapter tells us the order he made everything in. Well, maybe it's just poetic. It's what I get often. Two weeks ago, I had a gentleman come up to me. You have to remember, Matt, that this is a spiritual book. It's, there's poetic things in there. I, I agree, there are poetic things. But the first chapter is not poetic. When you go back and study the original Hebrew, the verb tense used there, it, it matches almost exactly to every other thing in the Word of God in the Old Testament that we would say is a historical narrative of something. It does not match the poetic portions of the Old Testament in just its grammar and its usage. It doesn't match. It matches historical narrative. So, worldview. Worldview affects how we, how we view the earth, how old it is. Is it six to 10,000 years old? Is it, is it 4.54 billion years old? What, what is it? See, how you read this book affects how you see that. It affects how you see each other. Did we all come from the first man and woman? Or was the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, were they just representative in the Bible of all of mankind that he had created? See, there's a, there's a concerted effort to, to show that, that maybe he created a bunch of people, but we just get the record of Adam and Eve. In churches, being preached on Sunday morning, another brilliant idea that, well, Adam and Eve were just the most advanced of all of the hominids that God worked us through in the course of time. So that Adam and Eve became the ones with his image, finally. Really? I missed that in there. It didn't say anything about a hominid in there. It very clearly says that we were created in his image on the sixth day. See, worldview affects how we see those things. Worldview affects how we, how we read this. Does this have authority over everybody. See, whether you believe that or not, it does. It has absolute authority. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. The reason he, he has the authority to say that is because you're, he's your creator first. See, if he isn't your creator, then this book, this book means nothing. It's just a nice, nice literary work. But see, he made it. He made everything. That gives him the authority to say, this is his word. This is absolute truth. Whether you believe it or not. <laughs> Whether you believe it or not. So this morning, I want to I give 12 things that are founded in Genesis that if we do not understand them from the beginning... We are going to be skewed other places. First, nature of God. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1, please. 
before we head to Genesis 1. Romans chapter 1. First chapter of Romans, powerful chapter to me. Look at what it says here in verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Now, wait a minute. Is the Apostle Paul, uh, is he clueless as to what invisible means? <laughs> he says there's these invisible things, but then he states what? We can clearly see them. That seems a little oxymoronic, doesn't it? Um, but wait, what does he say? Being understood by the things that are what? Made. So we're going to be able to see some things here about the Lord that are seemingly invisible, but we can clearly see them from things that he made, he says in verse 1 and 20. And then it goes on to give us those things. Even his eternal power and Godhead. So that they are without excuse. So there's two qualities here. His eternal power and his Godhead. What's his Godhead? Talk to me. What does that mean to you? Godhead. God the Father? Son? Holy Spirit. There we go. Okay. What we consider the, the triune nature of him. It says that we can clearly see this and understand it from something he's made. Go with me to Genesis chapter 1 right quick. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says what? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Those three words, beginning, heaven, earth, those three words are our existence. Now, why would I say that? In our existence, our understanding of our, of our universe, there's three very important things. Space, mass, and time. Without either one of those, we don't have any of the other ones. They're held together, as we put it in science, in a continuum. Meaning, when you, when you uh, move one or you change one, it affects the others as well. Space, mass, and time. Isn't it interesting? In Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, the beginning of what? Time. Oh, that's one of, our, one of our very things of existence is time. He makes the heaven and the earth. The word heaven there could also be translated as spaces or space. What's the other word? Earth? Arts? Could also be translated mass or matter. Wait a minute. So in the very first verse of all of Scripture, he gives us the, the three components of our existence? Are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. It, it would seem to make sense to me. If that was what we were going to be made up of, that's what he's going to do first. Now, how does this relate to Romans chapter 1 and the, his nature? Wait a minute. God the Father is eternal. He holds time here, Isaiah says, in his hand. All of creation, time included. He governs time. He set time in motion. And then he, then he came 2,000 years ago and put on mass. <laughs> put on flesh. Walked amongst us. Lived a life. Lived a sinless life. Unlike anyone else on the planet. And then when he left, he said, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to leave that space in you empty. I will come and I will fill it by my spirit. Our very existence is modeled after who he is. Space, mass, and time. See, the other really, really important thing in our existence, besides space, mass, and time, there's this thing called power or energy. It's polarity of atoms. It's, it's, it's part of some gravity. It's, it's all of this other thing. What's the next thing he does on day one? He says, let there be... Okay, so that's how I hear. I hear, I, when I read that, I hear that. I mean, like, I hear this massive influx of power like you and I do not understand. We cannot grasp. It is not the sun he makes on day one. He produces power and energy. From what? His glory. Who he is. Wait, wait, what was that other invisible quality that we should clearly see from things he's made all the way back at the beginning. His eternal power, the Apostle Paul says. 
when he says, let there be light, that's like he takes his glory and he, and he, and he, and he turns it on in a way that, that organizes every atom and every piece of matter instantly. So when Paul writes in Colossians that he holds everything together, hello, by what? By his power and his glory. His nature, clearly seen day one. We also get very clearly with the, with the creation of time, history begins. As I mentioned last night, there is nothing biblically prehistoric. Everything we understand is in history. So, so it's interesting, the details that are written in the first chapter here. See, in the first chapter, we get down here to verse 5. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. The most asked question of me, Matt, how serious do you think those days were days? <laughs> I, I can't tell you the number of times that I've had people come to me and say, well, but they don't have to be days, right? <sighs> you know what? They can be whatever you want them, want them to be, but that doesn't change what they actually are. Yeah, are you with me? If, if you want to make them a, 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 some undetermined period of time, you can believe that if you want. But please don't state that the Word of God says that. Because it doesn't. Anywhere in the Old Testament. Anywhere. But Matt, the word day, I mean, the word day mean, has several definitions, even in the Hebrew. Yom means, yes, it does. And it's always context that tells us how we should understand it. Always. So here in, <laughs> here in the first day, we have these two little, well, these two little distinctive things called evening and morning. Outside of Genesis chapter 1, in the rest of the Old Testament, when Yom has evening or morning attached to it, any time and every time Yom has evening or morning attached to it, it is always in reference, always in reference to a day as we would understand a day, a morning or an evening, as we would understand it. Never, never a longer period. And then we have another distinctive word here. First, one Day one. Every time the word yom, outside of Genesis chapter one, in the entirety of the Old Testament, if it has a number attached to it, it is always in reference to however many days that is. Always, as we would understand a day. Always. And here in these days, we have evening, morning, and a number attached to it. The plain reading of the first chapter is that we have days given to us. If, if those days were not days, those first six days, then why, when, when the Lord tells Moses and his people as he's delivered them out of Egypt and he gives them an understanding of what the Sabbath is going to be, that day of rest, if those days, because he used, remember we studied last night, Exodus chapter 20, verse 11 said, in six days he made everything. If those days were longer periods of time, how confused would his people be? If that's the frame of reference of, of a work week and a day of rest, if it was 6,000 years long, what were they supposed to do for rest? A thousand years of rest? Just going to rest now? We're not, we can't do anything. You see how that makes zero sense? The frame of reference is, actually, in all of the Word of God, the only reason we have a seven-day week period is because He said it that way. By the time we get to day four, and He makes the things in the heavens, they are not to govern weeks. They're to govern seasons and days and years. Seasons being months. There, there's nothing in the heavens that tells us that we should have a seven-day week. There have been civilizations on the planet that have tried to change that. They've tried to do like a ten-day week. Guess what? It doesn't work. Because God didn't make it that way. He made it six days, one day, seven days. 
only reason we have that is because the Word of God says that. So go to Jeremiah chapter 33 with me. Because see, I put something on the screen up here that I find the more I teach, people haven't read. It's not like, you know, Jeremiah is a, an oft-studied book. I understand. It's not, not an easy book. <laughs> to think of some of the things that the Lord tells Jeremiah to be, his, to be his prophet. Oh, Lord, do I have to say those things? Okay, so here, here, here he is in the 33rd chapter of Jeremiah. Verse 19 and following. 33rd chapter, 19 and following. And the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying, so here, here, here's what the Lord is telling Jeremiah to say. Verse 20, Thus saith the Lord, If ye can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night. Whoa, 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 hang on. What's that say about day and night? It's covenantally controlled. What's a covenant? A promise. Something we can count on. I mean, if the Lord gives us a covenant, it, it's a done deal. Well, now, wait a minute. You and I, we study that, well, we're, we're spinning on our axis, and there's that big burning ball of gas out there, and it, that's what gives us our day and night. Really? Not according to the Word of God. He put that in place to govern it, but it's actually a covenant. Day and night. Catch that? And that there should not be day and night in their season. So here's what he's saying. If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that they do not come at their, their season... What's their season, generally speaking? 12 hours and 12 hours. It's a 24-hour day that he's saying he set up. It's covenantally controlled. Check out what he says next. He says, if we can break it, this is what happens. Verse 21, then may also my covenant be broken with David, my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne. Whoa, hang on. Who is that? Christ Jesus. Let, let, me, let me reiterate what he's saying here. Tell the people that they can figure out how to break my covenant with day and night, then I won't send Jesus, who I've also given as a covenant to you. How important is this day-night thing? See, to me, this becomes very important. The first time we see day-night in all of Scripture is day one of history. Genesis chapter 1. See, here's the thing. If all we had was this for history, we would only have what this book says, and it says that he made everything in six days. And we would go, of course. And we did. We did for thousands of years. That's how we understood it. And then there were guys that came along in the 1800s supposed to be scholarly fellows. They came along and said, you know what, the rock layers, the rock layers show us epic periods of history, uh, hundreds of millions of years of history. The Bible cannot be right. And somebody in the church decided to trust that over this. I have a book in my office that was written in 1852. A fellow here in America. He, he get, he's getting wind of everything that's happening in Europe with Darwin and others, Charles Lyell, Huxley, all these guys that are coming along that are saying things like, Moses has it wrong. The Bible has it wrong. We have it right. And they were, they were infiltrating the church. And in, my, in this book called The Here and After, it is just astonishing to me to read in his words, warning the church. Do not get sucked in to this teaching. It does not hold up. He even says it. It doesn't hold up under scientific scrutiny. But it's here. It's in our Christian colleges. It's in our seminaries. Test me. Don't take my word for it. Test me. It's in our churches. Well, those days can't be days. There's got to be something out there that has shown that, that we have, we've, we, Bill Nye says it, it's inconsistent 
to say six to 10,000 years ago. What is inconsistent? There's zero evidence that says it can't be six to 10,000. Zero. Let's keep, oh, we got to keep going. There's 12 of these, and I'm on three. Okay. Living systems. Starting on, on day three, things begin being created by their living systems. First on day three is botany. All plant life is created by their kind to reproduce after their kind. On day three, when you study day three, you find out that the trees were made mature with fruit and there was even something put in the fruit, it says. Seed. Day three destroys the evolutionary worldview. Day three. We don't have to get to five and six. Day three. The seeds in that fruit is only going to make what? That kind of fruit. Apple seeds will always make apple. They don't make corn. Would it shock you, folks, that plant corn out here? You plant your corn, and then all of a sudden you get cherry trees. That would be a little shocking, would it not? But see, we can count on exactly what he told us that he did in living systems. He made them by their kinds. The observable scientific reality is created kinds only produce created kinds. Period. Evolution says all plants that we have, the corn that you plant, the wonderful corn is just like going crazy. Started as algae in the water a long time ago, and it's evolved into what you plant now. That's the evolutionary worldview. All plants started as algae, and then they, they worked their way, evolved into whatever we have. Grasses, trees, corn. You know what? Algae only produces algae. Algae diatoms in the fossil record look exactly like algae diatoms today. So evidently, that's been going on for a while. A ginkgo leaf from a ginkgo tree looks just like a ginkgo tree hundreds of millions of years ago, too. It hasn't changed either. Ginkgos still make more ginkgos. Because the observable reality is living systems were created by the Lord. Animals were created by their kind to reproduce after their kind. So when we get to day six, then he makes us not in the image of a chimpanzee or a gorilla, in his image and his image only. Chapter two, we get a magnification of day six from Adam's point of view. There's no confusion with chapter two when you understand the Toledos that were written in Genesis. Toledos are these major passages in Genesis that we have this, this is the generations of. This is the account of, depends on whatever translation you're using. These genealogies of. Chapter 2, verse 4, is it A? I believe it's, it's A or B, the second sentence there. In chapter 2, it, it, it says this is the account of the heavens. This is the, the generations. Meaning that's a total oath. That, that's, a, that's an ending line. That's like a signature line. Everything prior to that was the heavens and the earth being created. The next Toledoth is all the way over in chapter 5. And it says it's the generations of Adam. A lot of times in our, in our, in our English translations from the Hebrew, we've put these, these cool little headings in there. Please understand the headings are not in the original text. They're not. They're not in the original Hebrew. So we, we get caught up in this. So we have this Adam's descendants at the beginning of chapter 5. And it says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Somehow that, that has been constituted as a beginning of the next Toledoth. I disagree. I believe it's a signature line. I believe it's a signature line to everything prior to that all the way back to chapter 2. That's, so chapter 2 and chapter 3... And chapter 4 is from Adam's point of view. It's his, it's his account. It's his record for us. 
And chapter 2 is that he gets created and then he gets placed in this perfect place, right? All on day 6. He is placed in a perfect place. And, and then what does the Lord do? He says to him, there's no suitable helper for you. There's nobody suitable for you. There's nobody like you. And what does he do then in chapter 2? What's he do next? He doesn't put him to sleep yet. Go back and check it. He has him name all the animals first. <laughs> He has Adam name all the animals. This is all on day six. We know that woman was created on day six from chapter one. So this is a magnification of day six. He has him name all the animals. What is Adam supposed to notice when he, it was prefaced with, there's nobody like you? He's going to notice there's nobody like him. He's also going to notice there is a male and a female of everything. Then God states again in chapter 2, you're not supposed to be alone. He puts him to sleep, he takes a portion of his side, and he makes woman. He makes woman. Marriage is clearly spelled out in chapter 2, at the beginning. One man, one woman. That's it. There are zero other options. Zero. But see, if we miss chapter two, then there's like, well, we could go other places, other places in the Bible. But the other places are all in reference to here is what marriage is. That's it. There's not an option. I don't care if you like it or not. I don't care if that makes you feel good or not. I don't care. He also did not make five women and ask Adam to figure out which one he's most compatible with. The present dating scenario we have going on without bothering to ask the Lord who we're supposed to spend life with. I have a tendency to want to teach high schoolers that often. I wish somebody would have said it to me. So then we get to chapter 3. We find out in chapter 3 that there is good and there is evil. And there is somebody that has been placed in charge of evil. His name is Satan. We find out that sin enters the world. Through sin we have death. We have thorns. We have pain. Pain in childbirth, is that still active today, mothers? I often will have, ask kids, ask your, ask your mom when you get in the minivan later, if it hurt to, to have you as a baby. And they kind of, you know, <laughs> what? I'd love to be the fly on the wall in the minivan. <laughs> that part of the curse is still active. Sometimes it's not just the pain in giving birth, it's the pain of and or sorrow that comes from miscarriage. But then, we also see redemption and atonement given in chapter 3. Cover that here in a few minutes during, during worship time. And then there's chapters 6, 7, 8, and 9. If we miss chapters 6, 7, 8, and 9, we will miss the understanding of why we have layers of rock with fossils in them over the entire planet. The earth history of why the earth looks like it's millions or even billions of years old, the appearance of it is because of what happens with a judgment against sin, a global judgment against sin with, with the flood. If we miss that, we, we don't understand what, why we have petroleum. We don't understand why we have coal. All of those things can be explained because of the vegetation being buried during the flood. Then we go to chapter, chapter 11. 
Why do we have so many languages and we do not understand each other? It's because of chapter 11. Another global judgment against sin. We were not doing what he asked us to do after the flood. Fill the earth. (laughs) Spread out, fill the earth. (laughs) Repopulate it. We weren't doing it, so he confused our language. From the confusion of languages, genetics takes over. Genetics by people groups by language takes over. And then, voila, we have... We have differences of ethnicity. Today, we call them races. That's kind of evolutionary, this race idea. It, it, it kind of comes from this idea that we are, we are evolving, and therefore, it, we're in this race. And there should be one that's more favored than others. See, that was how it was originally came about. It's not biblical. Not biblical at all. There's one race. It's called the human race. Under this stuff, we're all the same. All the same. In God's eyes, we're all the same, except for one exception. Believer and unbeliever. Saved and unsaved. That is the only distinction in the Word of God that we see. The only. The only. Yet we don't bother to study this, and so now we're in this battle that we're in. (laughs) Hello? Hello? That's the battle we're in. We don't understand why we all look different. Because we haven't bothered to study this. We have all these other ideas running around. Biblical worldview. If we don't connect those 12 things, founded in Genesis, we will not understand the gospel. The life that comes from the gospel. Lord, today in this place, I... I praise you for your word again, as always. Lord, it is truth. It is absolute. Lord, help us to trust it. Help us to know and understand it. Help us to to seek after it daily. Lord, I praise you. I, I thank you for what it does in our life. Lord, those here this morning that, that don't seek after it yet, Lord, I ask that you... Uh, Give them a passion for it. Lord, allow them to know that you will help them understand it. Lord, it's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to be dismissed here um, in just a minute. And uh, we're going to come back for our morning service. So um, stop by the coffee bar, get yourself a pick-me-up there. And look looked like there were a few donuts left, so um, I left a couple there for you. So uh, you go grab some of those, and uh, we'll be back, meet back in here at 1045 for our morning service. And uh, the Miles have a book table um, in the gym um, with some resources there that would be a big help to you. Make sure to stop there after the morning service today um, and, uh, and get some of those materials there uh, that you can take home and continue the study. Uh, don't let this just be a two-day event. Um, continue to work on this, continue to study through and think through these things, especially if you have any questions about it um, or you're trying to work through it in your own mind. Uh, go ahead and take this as your jumping off point to be working on it, all right? And uh, God bless. We'll see you back here in just a few minutes.